Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Frost and Sullivan's latest webinar from our Energy and Environment Practice. Today's event is titled, Identifying Key Growth Opportunities for Electrification of Transportation. My name is Anna, and I oversee Frost and Sullivan's Growth Innovation and Leadership Briefings. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few notes. We will have some detailed slides on today's presentation, so there's a full screen feature available in the lower right-hand corner of your webinar player. You can safely share this briefing at any time via social media, email, or blogs. Today's discussion will also be available on demand shortly after we finished. And don't forget to submit your questions throughout the session today. Our presenters today are Farah Saeed, Research Director for Frost and Sullivan's Digital Grid. Farah has over 20 years of experience in the energy and environment sector. She has a deep understanding of business issues facing mature and emerging energy markets, and particularly the transmission and distribution with an emphasis on the smart grid. And Farah has authored several market insights on the microgrid, smart grid, demand response, and voice of customer analysis. And also our second presenter is Naren Pasupalati, Senior Research Analyst, also part of the, uh, the Digital Grid uh, practice here at Frost & Sullivan. Now, Naren has over eight years of experience in the energy and environment sector. Um, it also includes uh, his experience the thought leadership, research content, including energy, renewables, oil and gas, transmission and distribution networks, in addition to climate change, uh, the impact, and environmental conservation. With that, I would now like to hand the presentation over to Farah. Thank you, Anna. Today we would like to walk you through our most recent market analysis on disruptive technologies and solutions that are reshaping our electric infrastructure and the competitive landscape. Electrification of transportation, or EOT, is of particular concern for most utilities as it is expected to worsen grid imbalance issues to an already inadequate grid infrastructure. This past year, our team has looked very closely at demand-side management offerings to understand how these solutions are being developed and designed to handle grid imbalance caused by not only EOT, but also distributed energy resources. Today's subject is obviously EOT, and while we currently see a fairly small penetration of just half a million EVs on the road that are concentrated in just a few regions, the regulatory push for clean energy and carbon neutrality combined with changing consumer perspectives will drastically change the scenario. In fact, we anticipate those sales will most likely jump to 2 million by the year 2025. In this presentation, we would like to provide you with some insights on what utilities are adopting as well as their collectively staged presently. Having said that, as many are, that are in the, in the audience today are aware of, there is no one solution fits all and is dependent, highly dependent in fact, of local energy policies, tariffs, terrains, among other things. This makes it a highly interesting as well as a complex sector that is leaning heavily on energy of internet to provide intelligent solutions to address these issues that we'll be highlighting in today's presentation. But let's first understand what the issues really are. For that, I would like to ask your opinion in the form of a poll question. So our first poll question is, which of the following will be the greatest cause for grid imbalance as a result of EOT? The first is neighborhood effect of local distribution transformers such as the clustering of, of uh, EVs in a particular neighborhood. The second is peak demand. And third, improper charging infrastructure. I look forward to your responses. We'll give you a few minutes, and then we'll continue with the presentation, and we can respond to, we can take a look at these poll questions later in the presentation. We obviously think 
that it's a combination of all three that is going to further aggravate the distribution grid, as pointed here. My colleague Naren is now going to share a few insights that he learned during the course of this research regarding these issues before diving into the actual solutions that utilities are looking at. Right. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Farah, for the introduction. And thank you, participants, for joining us on the call today. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the results at the moment, but as soon as I get them, we can uh, pick it up at the end of our discussion. But let's take a closer look at some of these grid imbalance issues discussed in the question and in this slide here. First, electric vehicles themselves. The number of electric vehicles in the US have grown significantly over the last 10 years, and this trend is likely to continue over the next 20 to 25 years. According to the US EIA database, the number of pure passenger EVs is likely to grow from about 125,000 units in 2017 all the way up to 12.5 million units in 2035. Now, that's a 25% year-on-year growth during that very same time period. Now, this will pose a significant impact on the utility's ability to effectively deliver power for all EV charging needs. As we see here in this graph on the slide, the demand for electricity, the total demand for electricity in the US is forecasted to be relatively stagnant over the next 20, 25 years. But what's interesting is the proportion of electricity demanded for EV charging is likely to grow exponentially. We see that the percentage of electricity demanded as a result of EV charging has grown from less than 0.5% in 2017 to 2.5 to 3% by 2035. That's close to a 200% increase during that particular time frame. Now let's put that in perspective. So the energy demanded from EV charging in 2035 comes very close to the total demand, total energy demand from the entire state of California today. So that's the magnitude of EV charging, the electricity demanded from EV charging is going to be. So let's look at the next impact of EV charging that it has on the local distribution network. We know that some EVs during the time of a full charge almost equals the load of an entire household. And as stated earlier, a lot of the local distribution transformers or the neighborhood transformers have been built over 10 to 15 years ago, have not really factored the element of EV charging into them. Now this poses a serious problem to the local distribution transformer network. Based on our research, there are several studies that particularly highlight this problem. The table you see here on this slide clearly illustrates the depreciation rate of a local distribution transformer as a result of an additional EV connected to that grid. From this table, we see that with just two additional EVs that are connected to a local distribution transformer, the average annual depreciation rate, particularly during peak times, will go up from 0.6% to 9.6%. Now, what does that translate to? It translates to close to three to four years or that's being shaved off of the total lifespan of a distribution transformer. Now, imagine or consider a scenario in a locality where there are more than 10 EVs connected to just one transformer. There will be a rapid decline in grid stability, as well as in the overall health of the local distribution network. The next impact we're going to see, and the last problem, is peak demand. Peak demand events are usually caused when a number of EVs are charging simultaneously during specific times of the day when the overall energy demand is already high. Again, we have looked at several studies that point to this exact phenomenon. In fact, there was a recent study that indicated that 
in the state of California alone, there could be an additional peak load of over one gigawatt as a direct consequence of EV charging. In this particular slide, we, act, we see an actual representation of California's current energy dashboard. We see that the total available capacity is close to 30,000 megawatts, with the current demand as of its 14th November, 15th November, the current demand is close to 20 to 21,000 megawatts, and today's forecasted peak is about 28,000 megawatts, and tomorrow's forecasted peak is closer to 30 mega, 30,000 megawatts, almost reaching the available capacity in California's power mix. Now, imagine with that one gigawatt of excess peak load that is added to the grid utilities would definitely need to activate peaker plants or invest substantially on installing new generation capacity. All these measures are extremely cost intensive and at many times not feasible at all. So what are utilities actually doing to address these grid imbalance issues? There are a whole host of solutions you see here that utilities are currently adopting or planning to adopt in the near future. Having said this, as we see here in this slide, some of the core elements of a smart grid ecosystem offer the necessary solutions to utilities, such as distributed energy resources, demand side management, smart metering, and Internet of Things. We will get into the details of some of these of some of these solutions later on in this presentation. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at a typical utility decision matrix when faced with such a grid imbalance issue. For example, when the utility is faced with the issue of a stressed distribution set as a result of excessive EV charging, the utility will have a range of tools at its disposal and will most likely choose not one, but a combination of the strategies mentioned here. On the one hand, the utilities could adopt hard strategies such as building up larger infrastructure or installing new infrastructure or replacing the aged distribution infrastructure to meet the growing demands of EV charging. And on the other hand, it could adopt a range of softer strategies such as demand side management and various smart charging initiatives that would help shift the load of EV charging to make it more favorable for the utilities to supply the necessary power. Before we move on, I would like to pose another question to the audience here. In your opinion, what do you, how do you think utilities are most likely going to address the grid imbalance issues within the next five to 10 years? Do you see them predominantly adopting demand response strategies? Do you see them integrating renewable energy or storage solutions to their EV charging network? Or do you see them investing in more cost-intensive infrastructure such as smart distribution assets? Do you think it's all of the above or none of the above? Please take a few seconds to answer this particular question. Unfortunately, I may not be able to see the results right away but we can pick this up at the end of the conversation, at the end of the discussion again. Right. Uh, I hope everyone has answered the question, but we are of the opinion that it is probably all of the above. Of course, there is no one-size-fits-all solution, but a combination of these solutions 
that will need to be adopted based on the magnitude of the problem, the size of the utility, and most definitely the available funding to implement such strategies. Having said that, we believe there's actually a time-bound, three-pronged approach to addressing these grid imbalance issues we have discussed earlier. In the short term, a lot of the utilities we have seen have adopted softer strategies that include demand response measures, such as time of use rates and critical peak pricing. There are also examples of utilities installing a second smart meter for EV charging specifically. Now, this strategy would help utilities better track energy consumption patterns as well as loads so they could better prepare and plan in meeting these spikes in demand. For example, SDG&E have already in place several time of use rates and critical peak pricing rates for the EVs that are deployed within their jurisdiction. In the medium term, utilities would adopt a more aggressive approach in dealing with some of these issues. In fact, we anticipate that a lot of the utilities will begin to adopt modern smart grid technology, such as vehicle-to-grid technology, the integration of energy storage and renewables to their charging networks, as well as leveraging IoT technologies such as blockchain in their bid to address these challenges. For example, Silicon Valley Power, which is based in California, are already piloting blockchain technology for their vehicle charging, payments, and vehicle-to-grid initiatives. And finally, in the long term, utilities would have to adopt the harder cost-intensive strategies such as improving, enhancing, or even replacing TND transmission and distribution infrastructure that would include transformers, uh, installing higher capacity transformers, significant upgrades in substations, and other distribution assets. As we see here, there are examples that I've mentioned earlier, but there's one example of Duke Energy where they are currently piloting the use of solid state transformers or smart transformers in combination with a newly developed medium voltage fast charging system. They are currently trialing this out, I, I believe in the University of North Carolina at the moment. Uh, however, the results have not been out yet, uh, and, but this should be an interesting case study to watch out for. And finally, uh, I would like to pose the final question to the audience here before we move on. Uh, in your opinion, which transformative technology do you anticipate will have the greatest impact on the electrification of transportation within the next five to 10 years? Do you believe that it's wireless connectivity that includes, say, 5G technology? Do you believe it's blockchain, as we just discussed, as well as with transactive energy? Do you believe it's vehicle-to-grid technologies that would help utilities address some of these challenges? Do you believe it's wireless charging or battery substitution? Or do you believe it's none of the above? Please take a few seconds to answer this question. Thank you for your response. But let's pick this up at the end of our discussion once again. Right, so having looked at the strategies and some case studies, 
Let's take a closer look at how different regions in the U.S. and their respective utilities fare at addressing the issues discussed earlier. From the map here, we see that only a handful of states, such as California, Hawaii, and Washington, have a rather strong penetration of EVs in them. So why are some states doing better than the others? It could be a combination of several factors, including strong policy, uh, favorable incentives and subsidies, as well as the required funding to implement such strategies. Uh, in fact, California have very strong GHG emission norms, promoting the use of EVs in the state. They, in fact, also have an EV target of putting about 5 million EVs on the road by 2025 to 2030. So these are some of the strategies and incentives states are doing to put more EVs on the road. But the key takeaway fr from this particular map is that with EVs continuing to gain popularity across the several other states that don't have uh, a rather high EV penetration, there is a, going to be a large untapped opportunity in terms of putting the necessary grid infrastructure in place that would help utilities meet the growing needs of EV charging. So having looked at the states, let's take a closer look at some of the utilities in terms of where they are in addressing the grid imbalance issues. From the graph here, we see that there are a lot of utilities uh, with a significant high number of EVs in their jurisdiction are still pretty much at the early stage right now. For example, a lot of utilities, especially in California, such as uh, SNUD, SDG&E, have already in place several demand response schemes for EV charging already. And there are some utilities, such as, as I mentioned earlier, such as Silicon Valley Power, that have leapfrogged on the technology front by pilot testing blockchain for some of their initiatives. So these are some of the utilities that we are closely tracking to understand what their, in, uh, not just their incentives and schemes, but what their adoption strategies are when, EV, when more and more EVs come onto the road. Right, so we briefly spoke about funding earlier on in the discussion, and funding being a key factor in implementing some of these strategies. So to put in place the necessary transmission and distribution infrastructure to meet the growing needs of EV charging, the utilities will need to spend a considerable amount of money. Based on our research and conversation with a number of stakeholders across the EV value chain, we anticipate the level of spending by the utilities in the U.S. to go up from close to $74 million in 2017 to just shy of a billion dollars in 2024. Now, that's a 42% year-on-year growth for spending by the utilities on improving the grid infrastructure, predominantly transmission, and distribution infrastructure. We anticipate actually the bulk of this spending to, to would actually present distribution system and transmission system manufacturers and OEMs with the most opportunity here. This could include distribution transformer upgrades, substation uh, asset upgrades, um, including the need for smart transformers, and to some extent, even new smart meters. However, we must also note that the ancillary stakeholders, such as DR service providers and EV asset management service providers, although currently small, will have a significant business opportunity in the future. Now, having said this, and before we finally wrap up, let's take a quick look at the different business models that are present today when it comes to EV charging. On the one hand, we have a third-party management structure 
where we have the likes of Volta, EVgo, and EVbox establishing a comprehensive charging network that would provide EV charging as a service to the local community. They would essentially buy the electricity from the utility and in turn sell it to the ultimate EV user. We also have players such as EV Connect and Green Lots that would help the utility with all their connectivity issues associated with EV charging on the grid. And on the other hand, we also have direct utility management where control of all EV charging activities end-to-end -end would be from a complete utility standpoint. As mentioned earlier, we still believe there is going to be a significant business opportunity on the third-party management model where utilities would simply outsource their EV charging activities to the experts in that field. Thank you. I would now like to hand it over to Farah to give us our concluding points. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Naren. This is definitely an exciting time to be part of the energy market. So while growth of EVs certainly present challenges, uh, but it's also providing utilities the opportunity to enhance their offerings and gain stronger customer loyalty um, based on some of the offerings that uh, Naren covered today. Um, but this obviously requires investments to an already tight and thinly budgeted industry. As a result, our research indicates, as brought up earlier, that demand-side management would most likely be the first approach towards managing vehicle charging load. These are already being implemented to support the growing presence of distributed energy resources, as well as to meet state-level energy efficiency policy goals. In return, the idea is that longer term, batteries could even support the grid in terms of voltage optimization and minimizing duct curves. Having said that, upgrading actual physical infrastructure in form of digital substations, digital relays, upgrading to smart transformers are completely unavoidable and will have to take in place in parallel to adopting DMS. In fact, according to the DOE, 67% of all T&D assets today are at or past their useful life, and 60% of transformers in the U.S. are more than 25 years old, making the grid highly vulnerable and subject to failure given any tremendous imbalance. We know that replacing the entire infrastructure is obviously a fairly cost-prohibitive affair and would require a strategic approach to avoid any disruption or compromises to the grid. So now it, some are actually looking for an, the answers in the form of localized power, such as microgrid, evaluating how blockchain can ease transactive energy. So technologies such as 5G, V2G, blockchain are all going to have to play an instrumental role going forward. Our team obviously will continue to monitor these closely, these trends in the coming year. And with that, I would like to invite you to subscribe to our content to stay abreast of what is happening in the market. I hope you, you liked the presentation today, and we're, we welcome any questions that you might have, um, and we'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Naren. Now I'd like to just go over some next steps before we start our question and answer session. So if you'd like more information about joining our Leadership Council, we encourage you to reach out to us at 1-877-463-7678, or you can send us an email to myfrost at frost.com. Your feedback is always important to us, so under the Rate This button, please provide any feedback. And you can also uh, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter to keep up to date on upcoming webinars and growth and innovation leadership events. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and start the uh, question and answer session. But before we do that, I would like to go ahead and reveal the uh, results from our three poll questions. So the first poll question we asked our audience, which of the following would be the greatest cause for grid imbalance? as a result of EOT, 
And it looks like 26% of our audience um, selected the neighborhood effect, 46% indicated peak demand, and 26% indicated improper charging infrastructure. And our second poll question here, how are utilities most likely to going to address the grid imbalance issues within the next five to 10 years? It looks like we have 7%, it's a tie, 7% and 7% indicate demand response and investment in smart distribution infrastructure. And 84% indicate all of the above. And then our last poll question here we asked, which transformative technology do you anticipate will have the greatest impact on EOT within the next five to 10 years? And so we have about 25% uh, indicate the wireless connectivity, 5G. 16% indicate blockchain and transactive energy, 33% vehicle to grid, 16% wireless charging, and 8% none of the above. So Farah and Irene, any comments on these results? No, these are really, really great results. I think they tie very well to what we've uh, what we've tracked. Um, I'm surprised about vehicle to grid. I mean, the last poll question of 33%, um, almost one third of the audience felt strongly about vehicle to grid to be a transformative technology because whenever we talk to to uh, industry participants, they always seem to have a much more skeptical view regarding V2G. So it's promising to know that there is still some optimism around V2G. And we certainly do believe that that is going to be uh, personally a transformative uh, approach to, to addressing grid imbalance, to dealing with especially duck curves as we get more and more renewable power on board. So that would be my take. Um, otherwise, uh, the other poll questions pretty much were aligned with what we, what we presented in terms of peak power being the biggest, uh, greatest cause for, for grid imbalance. Um, that's something that we definitely agree. And uh, with the second poll question being all the above um, was also something that Naren had brought up. So um, these were good, good, good responses. Naren, did you have any questions or any comments? Uh, no, this, this is pretty much in line with what we were trying to say during the presentation. So I'm quite uh, pleased with the results because it's in line of our thinking as well. Very well, so we'll go ahead and start now with our audience questions. Our first question reads, what is your opinion about utility versus aggregator-based business model adoption, and what is most likely to go and take place and when? Did you want to take that, Naren? Um, sorry, can you just repeat the question again, uh, Anna? What is your opinion about utility versus aggregator-based business model adoption, and what is most likely going to take place, and when? Right. I believe I still believe that there is a lot of scope for third-party management uh, because uh, a lot of the utilities are still grappling with the issue of uh, the increased uh, penetration of EVs and the impacts it, it will have on uh, the grid. Um, so there are a lot of uh, players out there uh, that would, such as Green Lots and EV Connect on the one hand, that would provide incredible support to the utilities for some of their connectivity, installation, and operations of their uh, EV charging network. So you have players like that. And then you have players such as Volta Charging, uh, EV Box, EV Go, that would set up um, you know, the entire charging network all by themselves, you know, leaving the utility just to provide the electricity. Um, a lot of the utilities prefer these players to come on board so that they don't have to uh, invest further in dealing with issues surrounding EVs because a lot of the utilities are already cash strapped. So by investing more in terms of getting this EV infrastructure on the board would mean uh, a request for a rate hike, which uh, more often than not is challenged by the regulatory commissions, and it's um, and it's usually not very easy to get a, a, a rate a rate hike approval. 
So when you have third-party aggregators, it just eases the resources uh, as well as the funding on the part of the utilities to address uh, and meet the growing need of EVs. Thank you. And our next question here reads, what do you think will have a greater impact on grid instability, a clustered public EV charging or home charging? Uh, I believe uh, it could be uh, uh, both um, because uh, when you have um, – Cluster charging at workplaces or in commercial complexes, uh, they could, uh, and these would normally happen uh, during uh, peak times, uh, that's during an office going time, which would potentially put a lot more pressure on the grid at that particular given point in time. With EVs charging at home, um, although there could be uh, uh, you know, a slight spike in demand, during that time, which was normally past 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., uh, it would it's normally at the off-peak times, which will not really stress the grid as much. So I would definitely think that clustered EV charging, uh, especially in workplaces uh, or in commercial complexes, would pose uh, a higher risk to the grid stability than home charging. Thank you. And uh, our next question here uh, reads, grid reliability is the number one concern for utilities. What are your views around microgrids and its relation to EOT? And how many smart transformers have been deployed so far in support of EOT? Right. But those are definitely good, interesting um, questions. Um, it's one thing that uh, the industry is uh, exploring, um, having more localized power, having micro microgrids uh, in response to grid resiliency, particularly in regions that are more prone to uh, severe weather conditions such as hurricanes and tornadoes. I mean, several years back, um, following Hurricane Sandy, there were some East Coast um, utilities that took on the initiative of, of uh, investing in microgrids um, and uh, understanding how it could help them uh, with, with the grid resiliency. And I think it will certainly have an influence as well. Um, here in California, we're all obviously dealing with um, with uh, drought, um, and which have resulted in uh, more vulnerability to 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 fire um, uh, outbursts. So, so I think um, it's something that will be taken into consideration during the planning process of how localized power and microgrids could could uh, further enhance. The, the implementation of, uh, of the EOT. Um, in terms of smart transformers, they're still fairly small um, compared to overall uh, traditional distribution, distribution transformers. Just to give you an example, I think we are looking at an $85 million market um, as of today for transformers, which is a fairly small percentage of the overall uh, transformer distribution transformer market. Um, overall, in, in North America, we're looking at approximately $2 billion market for distribution transformer, and out of that, smart transformers obviously just account for 85%, for so it's, it's a fairly minuscule um, adoption of that, but uh, going forward, um, I think in most cases, utilities need to have a use case. They need to see proof um, and proof of uh, concept, <laughs> of a, a proof of um, technology, and I think that certainly is going to change uh, going forward, um, getting more familiar with the two-way bidirectional technologies, which they've already adopted through AMI, I think uh, smart transformers is, is certainly going to pick up in demand um, uh, uh, go, going going forward for North America. Naren, any, any comments on your end? Uh, none to add. Okay, thank you, Farah. And uh, I do not see we have any more questions here from our audience, so I'm going to conclude today's presentation. 
We hope you found today's webinar informative. I have posted a contact details information on the screen at this time. So if there's any other um, questions, please reach out to, you can reach out to Farah, to Noreen, uh, and uh, they'll get back with you. Their phone numbers and their email addresses are displayed on the screen. And we want to thank you for uh, joining us today.